If you don't have a Bible in your hand, put your hand up and we'll put a Bible into your hand so that you can follow along in the Word of God. Before I tell you where to turn in the Bible, let me give a reason why we are not in Hebrews this morning. It was my intention that this morning I was going to continue our study verse by verse through Hebrews and cover Hebrews chapter 12, 18 to 29. That was my intention, but we're not going to do that this morning, and I want to give you four reasons why we're not going to do that. Number one is the language in those 12 verses, the verbiage there, the truth contained in those verses. Some of it is obscured in the kind of the shadows of Old Testament law and sacrificial, the sacrificial system, and what it would require is it would require a very concise explanation of a few key points of Old Testament history. Number two, it's singularity. You know, the water in the well of those 12 verses, that water is multifaceted in its grace, but its focus is singular. Its essence is singular, and therefore it is best expounded during one focused, uninterrupted uh, sermon. Number three, it's magnitude. The truth of the water down in the well of those 12 verses is a very significant truth. And I don't want to. Matter of fact, I dare not trifle with it, but I want us to drink deeply when we do of its life-giving joy producing endurance, enabling divine refreshment. And then number four, finally, it's depth. The well of that truth in those verses, it requires a long rope to be let down in order to draw that well up. And the drawing up of it is laborious And so if those four kind of illustrated explanations don't make sense to you, kind of cryptic in its language, let me me rephrase it with a more simple kind of reason or explanation while we are not in Hebrews 12, 18 to 29 this morning. The passage is long. It's really hard to understand. It's even harder to preach, particularly in one message, and frankly, I'm not ready yet. And so we're going to push it off to next week, okay? So what I want you to do this morning is I want you to open up to Luke chapter 19. But I do want to encourage you with this, related to Hebrews 12, 18 to 29. Here's what I'd like you to do this week. I'd like you to, number one, pray Pray that the Spirit of God who inspired this book to be written, pray that the Spirit of God would open up to your mind, your heart, your understanding, the truth of Hebrews 12, 18 to 29. And then each day this week, it's 12 verses. Would you just take a moment each day this week to read those 12 verses? And once you've read them, take 10 minutes to reflect upon those 12 verses. Number three, would you just pick out a verse that kind of rises up for you as a a key verse within those 12 verses and just commit that verse to memory? Just keep it before you, maybe write it on a three by five card, uh, uh, just repeat it over and over, commit that verse to memory. And then finally, number four, come again next Sunday spiritually thirsty, and be ready to drink deeply from that well of truth in Hebrews 12, 18 to 29. But for this morning, let's go to Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus makes a statement, and in this statement, He is referring to Himself as the Son of Man. And he makes this quote that is a famous quote within Christianity. Jesus says, 
The reason that he came was to seek and to save the lost. To seek and to save the lost. Here is what I have seen personally this past week. I have seen Jesus doing just what he said he came to do. I have personally seen Jesus seeking and saving the lost. It's always a miracle when he does that because it's a miracle of taking someone from death, spiritual death, to spiritual life. Yet what seemed to stand out this past week are the circumstances within which I saw Jesus seeking and saving the lost. I won't give you a lot of details about it, but it was this. It's a tragic storyline. It's the story of the loss of a young life. Yet in the midst of that tragedy, Jesus walked into it and he took what the devil intended to bring destruction and he began redeeming and bringing eternal life to some that were lost. And what I believe is that he is still doing that today. I think he's still in the process in the midst of that circumstance, still seeking and saving the lost, and he is about the business here this morning of seeking and saving the lost. Therefore, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to look into the story, the historical account, in which Jesus made this statement that the reason he came was to seek and to save the lost. And I want to do that and answer a question that I believe God wants answered through this text. And the question is this, how is it that Jesus seeks and saves the lost? If he did that that day with this man in Luke 19, and he's still doing that today, how does he go about his work of seeking and saving the lost? Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. I'm going to ask you just to stand in honor to the Word of God, and we're going to read those 10 verses. Luke chapter 19, beginning of verse 1, referring to Jesus I read, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You may be seated. On the surface, here is what this story looks like. It looks like it's the story about a seeker. 
And that seeker's name is Zacchaeus, who is seeking Jesus. It looks like that's the main flow of thought in the storyline. But what I believe is that there is a much more primary storyline than that. In fact, that is secondary to the true storyline. And what the true storyline is about is that another seeker emerges. And the seeker that emerges and rises to the forefront is the person of Jesus Christ himself. And it's Jesus who is seeking Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is simply in a secondary way, responding to the seeking of Jesus Christ after him. The only reason that Zacchaeus is a seeker is because of what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing and enabling in this story. And so, let's look and see how Jesus, in Luke 19, 1 to 10, seeks and saves the lost. Here's the first truth I want to draw out to your attention. I'll state it, and then we'll look at it in the text. The first way that Jesus seeks and saves the lost is that Jesus turns your attention onto Him. Jesus turns your attention on to him when he is about coming seeking and saving a lost person Jesus turns the attention of that lost person upon himself now it's going to take a little bit of digging to see that truth here in this text but it is absolutely there clearly there look at verse 3 And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Let me give you a few truths about Zacchaeus and who he was. We hear here here in this passage that he's a man who is small in stature. But Zacchaeus was also a wealthy Jew. Zacchaeus held a a position in Rome's employ that made him a rich man. He was a tax collector for Rome. Why would this, this Jew, this wealthy Jew, be seeking to see who Jesus was. Jesus is a poor Jew. Jesus is a kind of a common class Jew. Why would Zacchaeus be so interested in getting a close look at Jesus? Well, here's why. Because the city of Jericho was abuzz with the story of Jesus. You see, Jesus was coming through their town. This one who so many claimed healed the sick and the lame and the blind with just a word. Jesus, this man who spoke as no one had ever spoken before. Jesus, this one who took authority over demons and commanded their obedience successfully. Jesus, who actually raise the dead. This man Jesus was coming through their town, making his way through Jericho. Here is the point. Jesus got Zacchaeus' attention. Those were the things that Jesus was doing that caused the word to get out and the crowds to flock, one of them being this man this wealthy man named Zacchaeus. And ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is doing the same thing today. 
The same thing that he did here 2,000 years ago. What the works of Jesus are doing. I don't mean the works that he did, that's part of the story, but the works that he, are st- that he is still doing. The lives that he is changing. Those that he is bringing spiritual healing to and touching and transforming them. The word gets out and people have their attention arrested by who Jesus is and what he is doing. If you are seeking the truth this morning, Jesus is using some circumstances in your life. He is using some people that he has sought out and saved. To get your attention. To turn your head in his direction. He gets our attention. Could be through any manner of circumstances. Even tragedy. Here is a very unusual storyline. With some unique things that take place in it but what is happening is Jesus is getting the attention or has gotten the attention of Zacchaeus and how does Zacchaeus respond when Jesus does that and how should you and I respond well we should do just what Zacchaeus did look at verse 3 and he was seeking to see who Jesus was Zacchaeus's desire began to have a close Look at Jesus. And so what did he do? He stopped what he was doing and he took the time to turn aside and put his focus on and seek out a closer look at the person of Jesus. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? If you are not a follower of Jesus here this morning... Has anyone told you, and if not, I want to tell you right now, that Jesus is the only answer to the human dilemma, that Jesus Christ is the only one who can give us peace with God. He's the only one that can forgive us of our sins and make us right before a holy God. He is the only one that can offer us eternal glory in heaven instead of impending horror in an eternal hell. Only Jesus can do that. So I ask you, if it's possible that that truth of Jesus could actually be true, is it not worth you turning your attention upon the person of Jesus Christ to find out if he truly is who he claimed to be, if he truly did what the word says that he did, if he truly has changed and can change the lives of people like those that know him that you know. It is the most important question that you can find an answer to. Notice here that Zacchaeus is faced with two obstacles in his effort to see Jesus. Two obstacles. One of them, at least, is shared in common with all those who are trying to see the truth of who Jesus is. First of all, Zacchaeus had a personal problem. Zacchaeus was born with an inherent obstacle to him in this story seeing Jesus. What was the personal problem that was a part of his genetics that he was born with? He was short. He was small in stature. That made it difficult for him. He inherited that condition. Listen, Every human 
is born with an inherited condition that makes it impossible for us to see truly who Jesus is. And that sinful con- that condition is called the sinful nature. And that sinful nature means that we are born physically, but we are born spiritually dead. We are blind to the truth of who Jesus is. Jesus has to do something to solve that dilemma. So we, like Zacchaeus, all of us, like Zacchaeus, are born with a personal problem that makes it difficult, even impossible for us to see clearly who Jesus is unless Jesus steps in and does something. And then secondly, Zacchaeus had a people problem. Not just a personal problem, a people problem. Zacchaeus' view of Jesus was blocked by those who were following Jesus. This is now a pause for effect. Let me say that again. Zacchaeus' ability to see Jesus was impeded because of those who were following Jesus. What a message to the church. Do the lost of the world gain a clearer view of Jesus by looking at us or do we hinder them from seeing the truth of who Jesus truly is? When the world, when those who are lost look at the church, when they look at followers of Christ, Jesus said, here's what they should see. They should see love that convinces them of the truth about the person of Jesus. The world will know that you're mine by the love that you have. You see, we should clear the path to Jesus, not bar the path to Jesus. We are to be light in a dark world that is pointing the way to the person of Jesus. But first truth again is this. When Jesus is on the hunt to seek and to save a lost soul, what he first does is he turns their attention upon himself. Here's the second thing that Jesus does in seeking and saving the lost. He gives them away to him. He gives them a way to see who he truly is. Jesus precisely did that for Zacchaeus. Let me show you what he did. Look at verse 4. So he, Zacchaeus, ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. You see, Zacchaeus had made some attempts to see Jesus, but probably maybe he tried to force his way through the tight crowd that was flocking around Jesus, but he was unable. Maybe he tried the kind of the hop and glance, hop and glance. But he couldn't, because of his stature, see over the crowd. But Zacchaeus is a resourceful man. He knew what he needed was he needed to get a better vantage point. And so what he did is he looked ahead down the trail. He looked at the trajectory of where Jesus was going. And he looked down the trail there. And he saw a large sycamore tree. And so he moved his short legs as fast as they could carry him ahead of the crowd and he shimmied up that sycamore tree to get into a vantage point in which he could see Jesus when Jesus passed by that way. And I can hear you 
may be the thought rumbling in your mind, Brad, what does that have to do with Jesus providing a way for Zacchaeus to see him clearly? And what does it have to do with Jesus providing a way for us to see him clearly? Well, you see, Jesus made a way for Zacchaeus to get that better look by providing a sycamore tree for him to climb. Do you understand that? Who created the sycamore tree? Jesus did. Who planted the very seed that became that tree? Jesus did. Who watered that tree with rain and who gave it the light and the warmth of the sun and the soil in which it could grow? It was none other than the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things are created and through whom all things are sustained. Jesus planted that tree to provide for Zacchaeus a way that he could see him clearly. That's the literal storyline here. And ladies and gentlemen, the spiritual storyline of truth is also this. Jesus provided a way for us just as he provided a way for Zacchaeus to get a clear view of him. Jesus planted a tree. A very different tree. It wasn't in Jericho, the tree that Jesus planted later some years later, was outside of Jerusalem on a hill called Golgotha. And it wasn't a sycamore tree. It was a Roman tree, a tree of rough-hewn timbers in the sake shape of a cross. That's a tree that Jesus provided so that we can like Zacchaeus, go to that tree. And in looking at Jesus on that tree, we can see him for who he clearly is. We can see so many truths about Jesus there. There hangs the holy son of God, the sinless son of God, whom they could find no fault with him because of his perfect righteousness. There hangs the embodiment of the love of God because God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There we see the willing work of Jesus. He who is the omnipotent God willingly not only surrendering himself unto the cross, but actually working to accomplish his own death on the cross. And there he hangs as the ultimate, perfect, and only Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world as the John the Baptist said at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he saw him across the Jordan River there, he cried out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What Jesus did is he went to that tree outside of Jerusalem. He drug that tree, in fact, down the streets of Jerusalem and up the hill outside of Jerusalem. And there Jesus was willingly nailed to that tree so that he could be hung up there on that tree. Hung up there to be seen. Hung up there to be seen clearly for who he is. Hung up above all other religious leaders and religious systems hung up there between heaven and earth, between a holy God of justice and sinful man hung there as the righteous Lamb of God 
paying the redemption price for our sin so that if we trust in Him and Him alone, His payment satisfies our debt against the holy God and removes the just wrath of God for us. You see, it's in looking at the person of Jesus hanging on the cross that we see the truth of who he is and what he has done. You must see him there. That's the view. Coupled with the view of his resurrection that makes all the difference. It's A look in faith at that picture of Jesus and trusting in who he is as the God-man and what he did there that provides new life and salvation. The only way that that can happen. So Jesus, just like he did for Zacchaeus, he provided a tree so that we could see him, see him clearly for who he is, so that he could seek and save us. So Jesus turns the attention of the lost to him, and then Jesus gives them away to him, and he does that through his cross. And then when Zacchaeus got to the tree, I mean, when Jesus got to the tree that Zacchaeus was up in, up in, something happened, which brings us to the third thing that Jesus does as he seeks and saves the lost. Jesus, number three, calls for a personal relationship, a personal trusting relationship. Luke chapter 19, verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus just wanted a look, but what Jesus was after was a life, and he always is. He always is. Now look at what Jesus called Zacchaeus to. What did the call of Jesus include? When he called Zacchaeus to himself. It's the same principles and truths that it includes today when he calls someone that is lost into saving faith in himself. First of all, it includes a knowledge of who you are. Just think about that storyline. The whole implication of the story is that Zacchaeus didn't know Jesus. He would never met Jesus. He was wanting to get a vantage point to see this one that he had heard so much about but had never met. And Jesus comes to his tree, and look what he does. He looks up in the tree, and he calls Zacchaeus by his name. And he says, Zacchaeus. I must come to your house. Jesus had an intimate knowledge, a personal knowledge of Zacchaeus. He knew Zacchaeus and his station in life. He knew about his wealth. He knew about his small stature. He knew that he was seeking to get a closer look at Jesus. He knew about every sin of Zacchaeus. He knew about what was probably a lifestyle in which he extorted from the Jewish people money that lined his own pockets. He knew all about Zacchaeus, and Jesus knows all about you. He knows all about every one of us. He knows even your most blackest sin, and yet he does the same that he does for Zacchaeus here. He comes not to judge, he comes to call you to himself. He comes and he speaks 
personally to you and he invites you to come and have personal, intimate relationship with himself. Knowledge of who you are. Secondly, the call of Jesus included an immediate call for a response. Do you see it here in the story? Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Hurry and come down. When Jesus comes to seek and to save and he begins working in the heart of those who are lost and he reveals to them who he is, he calls for them to make an immediate response. Procrastination can lead to damnation. The time to respond to the call of God is when the call of God is ringing in your heart, when the Spirit of God is drawing you to the person of Jesus, not to put it off, but to act upon that voice of God that is bringing to you the truth of the person of Jesus Christ. And then number three, that call of Jesus to Zacchaeus included a close connection. What did Jesus say to Zacchaeus? He said, I must stay at your house today. That's what he asks of us. Always. That's what he asks of those that he seeks and he saves. He says, here's what must happen. You and I must enter into a personal, intimate relationship. Matter of fact, I must come into your home even more. I must become the Lord of your home. I must come and stay at your house. And how did Zacchaeus respond to that call? Verse 6. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. He responded quickly and willingly, welcoming Jesus in. And that's what we must do. Christianity is not about a religion. It's about a first-hand experiential living relationship with the very Lord of creation and Lord of life himself. It is a call into deep relationship, trusting relationship, lifetime relationship, growing relationship. So what does Jesus do when he is pursuing a lost person to seek and save them, he turns their attention onto himself, number one. Then he provides a way for them to see him for who he is. And that way is through his life, his death, and his resurrection, that hanging upon a tree. And then he calls for a personal relationship with himself. And then look at Zacchaeus's response. After being sought out, and I would add, as the text will, saved by Jesus. Jesus deserves the place of lordship. Jesus comes to seek and to save you so that he can become your Lord. Verses 7 and 8. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone into, to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord. He said to the Lord. And what did he say? Behold, Lord. Zacchaeus is identifying Jesus as his Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. 
There is a strong implication here, an undeniable implication here between verses 7 and 8, that there is some time that elapses here because Jesus goes into Zacchaeus' house, probably reclines with him at the table, has a meal with him around the table, and after he's there for a period of time, what happened? Here is Zacchaeus, after spending probably a few hours with Jesus, has a radical change of life, a radical change of life. Notice it here. Zacchaeus displays great compassion. What's the first promise out of his mouth? It's about the poor. I give half of all that I own to the poor. Secondly, he desired great integrity. And he was willing to pay dearly for it because his second promise is focused on giving back, repairing, or making restitution fourfold to anyone that he has wronged. Displayed compassion, desired great integrity, and then number three, he delivered a public witness. He delivered a public witness. He proclaimed to those, he stood up there in the midst of that group of people and proclaimed Jesus as his Lord and made lifestyle changes publicly related to who the Jesus was. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus did not die for us in obscurity. Jesus died for us, sacrificed for us in a very public forum. There was a trial before the Jewish religious aristocracy, and then that was followed by a public trial in broad daylight attended by the masses, and then came the public torture, and forth the public show as he was paraded through the city streets, prodded along as he stumbled out of the city and up that hill under the weight of his cross. And then when he got to that hill, he was nailed to and lifted up so that all could see him hanging there on that cross, exposed for you and me. He made a public sacrifice to save us. He deserves and expects when he has sought you and saved you for you to go public with it, for you to go public with it like Zacchaeus did. Luke 19, 9. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You see, when Jesus saved Zacchaeus in that encounter, that salvation included not only the forgiveness of his sins, but it included securing the heart of Zacchaeus. He had compassion. It included securing the pocketbook of Zacchaeus. I give half of my wealth to the poor and I pay back fourfold. And his mouth, he declared him to be Lord. When Jesus saves, he wants to secure, and he does, if he truly saves, secures our heart and secures all the components of our life under his lordship and our mouth and our testimony to begin speaking about the good news of the seeker, Jesus, who sought out and saved us. He is the initiator. He is the true seeker. And if 
you are here this morning and you are sensing a pulling on your heart. You've not committed your life to Christ. What Jesus is doing right now is he is seeking to save you. Do what Zacchaeus did. Put your trust in the person of Jesus and him alone, who he is and what he's done through his life, death, and resurrection. And he will make the declaration over you that he made over Zacchaeus. Today, salvation has come to this individual. Today, salvation is theirs. And what we get to do, what we get to do as we conclude this service is we get to just see another living illustration of the seeking and the saving work of Jesus through baptism. Baptism is an act of obedience. Jesus said that his followers, those who trust in him, should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What baptism does is it paints a picture of what the individual who is being baptized truly believes in. As they are placed under the water, it is a picture that they are trusting in the person of Jesus and his sacrificial death in payment for their sin. And as they come out of the water, it's a picture of their trust in the person of Jesus who defeated death, rose again to eternal life and is offering them and has given them eternal life because they trusted in him. And so this baptism is a picture of the seeking and the saving work of Jesus and the individual's trust in that. Pastor Shane.